Let's get started. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Sergey Gavrilets. I'm a professor of ecology and uh, evolutionary biology and mathematics here in Knoxville. I'm also director for the Center of uh, Dyna Dynamics of Social Complexity and associate director at Nimbus, with uh, uh, two uh, institutions that are uh, organizing this series of events. And if you haven't checked uh, our website uh, yet, I strongly recommend you to do that. And Nimbus has been around for more than 12 years and it's been a major center for research at the interface of uh, biological, mathematical, and social sciences. And just to get you some feel for what uh, we've been doing here, uh, we had more than 8,500 visitors uh, since the inception of uh, Nimbus. Of course, uh, it, everything was uh, before the pandemics. And DISOC is much uh, younger, just uh, two years old, and it's one of uh, the spin-offs uh, where uh, emerged uh, from Nimbus. So uh, this webinar series is uh, one of the outputs of a grant uh, funded by the John Templeton Foundation to promote research on cultural evolution and also to promote cultural evolution society. And, and Peter is the PI and, and I was helping him with that. And uh, what we'll do here, uh, we'll have, as you know, we'll have uh, nine different lectures. And uh, the main part of these lectures are uh, seminars uh, by the lead designers of online teaching modules. And these are here in, in the middle in, uh, in bold black. And we also have uh, two lectures uh, by two members of uh, the working group that was established by the Society of Cultural Evolution to organize a run international competition uh, that uh, resulted in these teaching modules. And on top of that, we have two invited speakers, uh, Peter Torchin and Ruth Mays. Uh, and uh, besides running very successful research uh, programs, we're also founding uh, editors of two important journals in our field. Uh, one is Clio Dynamics the Journal of Quantitative History and Cultural Evolution. And in our one is uh, Evolutionary Human Sciences that Ruth uh, started uh, just uh, two years ago. So next, I think, Eric, uh, if you could uh, tell us a bit about logistic. Well, thank you very much, Sergey. Um, today we're running uh, the seminar through uh, Zoom webinar. And if you look at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A area. Um, during the talk, if you could please put your questions in there, you have the ability to look at other people's questions, upvote them, comment on them. And then at the end of the talk, Sergey will moderate those questions and, and uh, Peter will, will have a discussion about them. Uh, I'll be monitoring the chat, but please do put all your questions in the Q&A section. Thank you very much. Have a great talk. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, yeah, so I'm going to introduce uh, Pete, but I want to kind of try to give you a bigger picture first. So just in a few months, we will be celebrating the 150th anniversary of Darwin's book, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to sex. And this is a very important book, but probably it's a little bit less known where uh, his Origins of Species, that was published uh, 12 year, years before. And as far as our science is concerned, uh, there are at least three important insights coming from the descent. One is that humans, like uh, any other species, were a modified descendant of some pre-existing form. And for, uh, for us, it's great apes with whom we share a lot of uh, characteristics in de developmental, physiological, psychological, cognitive, uh, as well as genes. And the another in insight is that culture and cultural e evolution were particularly important uh, in our history and, and, and human evolution. And here I have a couple of quotes uh, from Darwin. One emphasizes the fact that in humans, uh, uh, natural selection by which uh, Darwin meant uh, basically what we would call now selection on genes uh, is, uh, has, uh, is of lesser importance when 
types of selection uh, acting on uh, cultural variation. And here in this quote, he talks about uh, education, about public opinion, about customs. And then there is another quote here at the bottom where he says that the expression of the wishes and judgment of the members of the same community serves as the most important secondary uh, guide of conduct. Uh, and decide social instincts. And that's basically he's talking about social norms. And the field insight uh, concerns the importance of uh, cooperation in our species. And there is this famous uh, quote from Darwin where he discusses a uh, tribe that can uh, become very successful if uh, its members are willing to sacrifice themselves for the benefit of uh, the whole group. Uh, this idea has not really been developed much for an hour, 30 years or so. And it was uh, Pyotr Kropotkin who uh, published uh, his book, A Mutual Aid, A Factor in Evolution, in 1902. And his main uh, thesis was that cooperation and mutual aid were uh, one of the most important mechanisms of adaptation and increased survival that were common across all uh, branches of life, of course, in, including humans. And this is how we now uh, view uh, cooperation. Um, so uh, biological evolution and cultural evolution, we have uh, certain things in common. In particular, the major forces are the same. It's variation, uh, selection, and inheritance. But these two uh, branches of science have developed at somewhat different rates. Uh, evolutionary biology is a very mature and well-established science for at least 100 years. Uh, Fisher, Dabzhansky, Meyer, Haldane, Simpson, and others, they published a number of very important books in the 30s and 40s that uh, led to what is now known as modern synthesis. Uh, society for the study of uh, evolution, biological evolution, was formed in, in 1946, and that was the same year when uh, the journal evolution was established. And by now we have uh, departments of ecology and evolutionary biology in pretty much most uh, major universities. So the field of evolutionary biology uh, has been developing very rapidly for a very long period of time. In contrast, as far as cultural evolution is concerned, uh, things started to change only relatively recently. Here I show two graphs. It's from the Web of Science. Uh, the number of citations of papers that have cultural evolution in the title on the left or in the abstract on the right. And you can see here that it's basically starting around 2000 when uh, a very rapid uh, exponential growth uh, started to occur. Um, so uh, there has been this uh, big delay, but now uh, things are moving forward uh, very rapidly. And it's not just the number of uh, citations, of course, but also uh, cultural evolution and cultural evolution thinking is finding various applications in a diversity of fields. And it's biology, anthropology, psychology, uh, political science, law, even economics, and now even history. So uh, there is a lot of things going on. Moreover, uh, we now understand that uh, some of the most urgent problems with our society faces uh, can uh, solving this problem uh, can greatly benefit from the insights provided by cultural evolution because cultural evolution and our cultural instincts and traditions will greatly affect how we behave, how we make uh, certain decisions. And of course, uh, now, uh, given all this growth, it's not surprising that the cultural evolution society uh, was formed uh, a couple of years ago. It's interesting, of course, why it took that long. Uh, moreover, there was one uh, attempt uh, to set up this science that was undertaken by Nikolai Rashevsky in the 40s and the 50s. Uh, so he actually was quite successful in setting up mathematical biology as a science and also setting up uh, the first journal uh, of mathematical biology and uh, his activities resulted in the establishment of the Society for Mathematical Biology in 1972. Uh, and uh, uh, in the 40s and 50s, he also published a number of papers on, uh, on basically on cultural evolution. He was kind of a modern mathematician. Um, 
And he had um, some very great insights, for example, here at the bottom I have this quote that I like a lot. And that's something what he said in the 50s. Uh, problems in history may still turn out to be as inspirational for mathematicians as problems of physics have been and as problems of biology are bound to become. And of course, problems of biology we did become extremely important. And but things are now uh, happening uh, with historical science as well. So it was a very interesting attempt, uh, but for a number of reasons, uh, it, uh, it didn't really uh, produce a revolution in science. He didn't leave uh, students, and his work, unfortunately, was uh, pretty, much, pretty, pretty much forgotten. So we had to wait for another 40 years uh, before a couple of books were published. And it was one book by uh, Luke Kavalis Forza and uh, Mark Feldman published in 81, uh, Cultural Transmission and Evolution. And then the second one was published by uh, Peter Richardson and Rob Boyd in 85, Culture and uh, Evolutionary Process. Uh, so basically, this uh, explosion uh, in research on cultural evolution and um, this scientific revolution that we are witnessing uh, now was pretty much started uh, by these four people in uh, these two books. Uh, what was interesting is that both these books were pretty heavy on, on mathematics. Um, so um, we are very happy uh, to have here Pete with his presentation because he is basically one of these people. Um, and Pete, uh, he got his bachelor's degree in entomology in UC Davis and then uh, PhD in zoology in 1961, and then he's been at uh, UC Davis since 70, 1977. So now he's a professor emeritus there. And it has hundreds of papers. I just highlight one here, uh, cultural group selection plays an essential role in explaining human cooperation, a sketch of evidence that I highly recommend. Uh, and he has dozens of students, and he's the first president of uh, the Cultural Evolution Society. And he's the PI on this proposal that produced resulted in the teaching modules that will be discussed. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Pete. Pete. Okay. Now. All right, are we ready? Yeah. It looks great, Pete. Okay, so okay. I will proceed. So what I want to talk about today is the outreach of the uh, Cultural Evolution Society. And my subtitle here is everybody needs to know a little bit about uh, cultural evolution and the import of that will be clear shortly, I hope. How do I end? Oh, there we go. Uh, so the Cultural Evolution Society, as uh, as Sergey said, was established in 2016 with support from the uh, Templeton Foundation and a grant to David Sloan Wilson. We've had two uh, biennial conferences. We're planning a third one for Hokkaido in 2021. It was postponed from this year. We have around 300 uh, paid up members. And I invite anybody who's uh, interested in cultural evolution to join. And there's the uh, URL if you need it to get there. The present president is Rachel Kendall from Durham. And the president elect is Kevin Leyland from St. Andrews in, in England. Scotland. 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 My wife is hassling me about the nations of the UK. Uh, Grand Challenges uh, was uh, something that uh, uh, was produced uh, by the uh, uh, the steering committee that uh, uh, put the society into operation. And so the we wrote this essay. The, the real leader of it was Peter Peregrine, who you see there in the 
in the author list. And uh, so what we did was uh, a survey of the field, asked lots of people to give comments about uh, what the most important uh, uh, challenges were for uh, the field of, <coughs> excuse me, the field of cultural evolution. And the overarching theme that the uh, uh, Grand Challenges exercise uh, produced was that uh, uh, knowledge synthesis was uh, the most single most important thing. Every, much of what uh, people said about the important uh, uh, things in uh, challenges for the field uh, uh, revolved around this. I mean, uh, as Sergey's already noted, a, a huge number of fields have have at least a toe in the water of, uh, of cultural evolution. And it's one of those things that I think of as, as a, uh, for the social sciences and much of uh, behavioral biology as well. It's, it's kind of a synthetic uh, uh, principle to, uh, that pulls together a, a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, material in, in a lot of fields. Uh, and we, aside from that, um, uh, overarching uh, theme, we identified uh, eight uh, challenges, basically, and here are those. The ones in red are the ones that are, in my mind, most closely related to the uh, uh, new Templeton grant that Sergey and I wrote that uh, is uh, really the, uh, that provided the money that uh, in turn provided the uh, modules that I'll talk about uh, in a moment and that are the subject of, of this uh, webinar series. So, uh, the, so the ones that I've highlighted are modeling culture as a complex adaptive system, integrating methods and data and results across disciplines and, and uh, uh, educating policymakers and the public about uh, uh, cultural evolution. Uh, now that the uh, Templeton grant that uh, Sergey and I uh, wrote uh, uh, and we submitted in, in 2018, uh, the, our basic argument was that uh, uh, dynamic models are in, in all of the natural sciences are the basic theoretical uh, um, uh, underpinnings of the, of the field. I mean, Newton and Leibniz uh, 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 started this approach to uh, uh, dynamic uh, systems uh, uh, centuries ago. And it, it, as Sergey indicated, it's uh, spread from physics to uh, other physical sciences and uh, chemistry, for example. And uh, eventually biologists became uh, devotees of bu uh, building theory on the basis of coupled uh, differential or difference uh, equations. And, and uh, uh, the social sciences have been uh, uh, tardy in, in taking up this uh, 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 framework. Uh, there are scattered applications in economics and other other sciences, but uh, uh, but not uh, it isn't uh, so fundamental as, as we thought it should be. Uh, so there's certainly no buddy quarrels with the idea that uh, human cultures like genes, uh, human cultures, human genes, and societies are dynamic. Uh, that's uh, uh, kind of obvious on on the face of it, uh, uh, and yet the theory that uh, is uh, uh, articulated in terms of couple couple differential and difference equations uh, are, as I say, little used in the social sciences. So uh, the cultural evolution field is an exception for the reason that that uh, uh, Sergey articulated. It was the the initial impetus for the field uh, included uh, uh, Kavali's and Mark Feldman's book and Rob's and my book. And so uh, those are kind of taken to be part of the foundation of the field, not to say that lots of other people uh, didn't contribute. For example, uh, uh, linguists have, uh, comparative linguists and historical linguists have always been pretty sophisticated evolutionists going back to to Darwin's day, but uh, uh, at any rate, we got mathematics kind of in on the ground floor of the explosion of uh, of interest in cultural evolution that uh, that Sergey showed you. Uh, so what we proposed to do was develop online educational materials. 
that could be used to uh, bring a dynamic perspective to social science issues. And sorry, I've I've got a uh, hypersensitive mouse here. Uh, this thing wants to jump around on me, but I will try to get a little better at controlling it. Uh, so, uh, so we. Uh, decided to aim these educational materials at, uh, uh, of, uh, or at least invite proposals to aim them at different levels uh, of anything from the general public to, uh, uh, to graduate students in say history that need to know how to, how to uh, build models. And uh, so we wanted this to be a kind of a service to the, uh, to the uh, social scientific community, broadly uh, speaking. And uh, so we invited uh, uh, proposals. And uh, I, I approached Sergey to uh, host this at Tennessee because I'd been on their, uh, the NIMBIOS uh, board and uh, board of visitors, I think uh, you call them. And uh, the, uh, uh, it seemed like the NIMBIOS and then uh, DISOC had the right philosophy and the right infrastructure to support the kind of uh, uh, work that we thought uh, should be done. And so uh, that is what we did. And one of the uh, important components, uh, we spent a lot of Templeton's uh, uh, money on, on uh, outreach teaching model, uh, modules uh, on uh, cultural evolution. So the uh, there's a list of them here. Uh, the first one, models of social dynamics and in introductory modules. So this is uh, uh, Paul, Paul Smaldino is a mathematical, uh, uh, well, mathematical, a little bit of everything. And uh, so he uh, uh, has developed a module that uh, takes an interdisciplinary approach to modeling uh, social behavior. Animal cultures, core discoveries in New Horizons, a team led by Andy Whiten, including Lucy Applin uh, and uh, Nicholas Claudieri and Rachel Kendall, our current uh, society president. Uh, they uh, review the uh, uh, recent work on animal cultures. And this is kind of a golden age of, uh, of the study of animal social learning, animal uh, uh, culture. Back when Rob and I were uh, first starting in this uh, field, uh, uh, People would, even in those days, still say that uh, culture was restricted to humans. That, that of course, was not. We knew a little bit about chimpanzee culture and rat culture and a few other examples of uh, animal social learning. Uh, but it was in those days. It was still possible to think, well, uh, social learning in, in other species is just kind of marginal. There's a little bit of it, but it's not much to worry about. Uh, and it turns out that. Andy and many other people by now have uh, convinced me at least that uh, not only is social learning in, in uh, other species widespread, it's uh, important in those uh, species. So migration patterns of ungulates are, turns out are culturally transmitted. If you disrupt the uh, social transmission, uh, the, uh, the animals don't know how to migrate anymore. And for many of them, migration is pretty fundamental to their ecology. Uh, uh, the uh, never-ending story, cultural evolution and narratives uh, by, uh, created by Joseph Stubberfield and Jamie Tirani uh, and Oleg Subcheck is, uh, uh, I mean, people tell stories and we tell stories about our lives and we tell stories about uh, the lives we should lead and the lives of heroes and, and it goes on and on. And, uh, uh, these things evolve and, and they're extraordinarily important in, in our everyday life. Uh, our current U.S. president is a, uh, is a, a practice storyteller. Uh, or it, it, well, it's his only known real skill. Uh, 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 the Foundations of Cultural Evolution uh, Question and Tools Approach is created by Adrian Bell. And Adrian uh, is a, a mathematically sophisticated uh, ecologist, and he got his uh, degree with us here at Davis in uh, doing work on cultural evolution. And so this is uh, a basic undergraduate uh, 
introdu level introduction to the body of formal theory that stands behind uh, uh, cultural evolution. So uh, people could uh, use this as a basis for a, a, a part of a course in evolution, for example, or uh or to teach their own course in in that particular uh subject so he's developed a, a very nice uh, uh platform for a simulation platform uh, the modeling the dynamics of cultural diversification uh created by bernard coach and eric Desfeld, uh, uh michael alfaro jacob foster and danielle silvestro uh is uh well, this is a kind of a macroevolutionary topic. And one of the things that's spectacular about humans is the extent to which we've diversified, uh, particularly in the Holocene, uh, uh, based upon cultural adaptation. So I think of, uh, of human evolution over the last 10,000, 12,000 years as substantially a, uh, an adaptive radiation. If uh, we've got uh, 7,000 different languages and 7,000 uh, economic systems associated with those languages. So that's a uh, sort of a coral reef level spectacular uh, adaptive radiation. And their module is uh, designed to uh, uh, give us some basic insights into the theory that should stand behind that phenomenon. Uh, there, uh, those are all modules that uh, are published on the uh, uh, Nimbus uh, DISOC uh, website now, and there are two more that are coming. Uh, Dynamic Models of Human Systems, created by Russ Jene, Cheryl Davidson, Diana Fisher, and myself, uh, is uses the uh, uh, Stella simulation platform that is uh, that heavily promoted to uh, uh, math the mathematics departments of high schools and uh, are mathematically inclined teaching in, in high schools. And uh, so we have aimed these modules, our sort of uh, uh, main target is that audience of, uh, of kids that are uh, just beginning to learn uh, their, uh, learn calculus and, and, and can begin to appreciate uh, uh, dynamic models. But it's also, uh, it's got a simple interface that can be exercised uh, without understanding the math at all if you want to so you can understand uh, graphically what the math does without uh, actually uh, having to pay much attention to the math itself so this might be something that even say a graduate student in history could get uh, some feeling for what the uh, uh, what that has no mathematical background at all could get some idea of what the math models can and can't uh, uh, do and the final one, Cultural Evolution of Dynamic uh, Learning by Carol Akai and, and Marco Smola is uh, developed in order to better understand complex interplay between culture and social network structure. Uh, uh, obviously, social networks are the conduits by which culture is, is acquired and, and much of the sort of operation of culture also is, is through uh, uh, social network. So that's an important concept. So we hope that these uh, modules will be attractive and, and will uh, uh, be used by people to uh, uh, introduce themselves and their and their students to uh, uh, cultural evolution. And if, as I say, uh, five of them have already been published. And so uh, you can get, uh, 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 you can see what we're up to if you're interested or might have a use for these uh, modules. Okay, so now I want to change gears and talk about uh, what uh, I think the future of the uh, human sciences ought to look like. And uh, my model here is, is uh, the evolution of biology between about 1950 and 1990. Uh, uh, so biology has become an extremely uh, successful collection of uh, discipline or interdiscipline, I call it. I'll come to what I mean by that as we go along. Uh, so over that period, uh, uh, there were dramatic uh, changes in the way uh, biology was organized, taught, and uh, funded that uh, have made it an extremely successful science. And so it seems to me that the uh, 
human sciences might want to, uh, uh, particularly the social science side of the human sciences, uh, might uh, uh, want to uh, emulate uh, biology. Uh, so I had a ringside seat to, to this uh, evolution. I was a high school student in the in the uh, uh, 50s, and I had one great uh, high school biology teacher. He was a natural historian. He didn't teach me any cellular or molecular biology at all, uh, but he turned me into a pretty good uh, invertebrate zoologist, and that was a lot of, of uh, fun. I was an undergraduate student at Berkeley and Davis. Uh, I was an entomology major, um, and my faculty, co uh, the faculty that taught me were mostly systematists is what they really like to do. Uh, they like to describe new species and, and reorganize genera and that sort of thing. And they were complimented. Uh, it was a, a applied science department. So uh, what, I, what uh, people called in those days nozzle heads, uh, they were just looking for chemicals that killed bugs and, and uh, uh, they made fun of themselves even by calling themselves nozzle, nozzle heads. I remember a seminar in which a guy described himself as a reformed nozzle head. Uh, uh, and then I went to grad school at Davis in the zoology department and I studied aquatic ecology. And the zoology department was one of these old fashioned kind of uh, uh, syst uh, uh, taxon based uh, uh, disciplines that biology had uh, grown up with for the first half of the of the 20th uh, uh, century. The senior faculty were ecologists, systematists, and so on, uh, traditional guys. The junior faculty were all sorts of things. Uh, uh, like my major professor was a limnologist. He studied the ecology of, of lakes. And there was a lot of tension between the old guard and the new guard. My major professor was the first guy to get an NSF grant in the department. A lot of people thought that was sort of outside the, I don't know why they thought this, but the, 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 we'd never done that before kind of stuff. So it was uh, entertaining to see the, uh, the soap opera of that uh, uh, department. Uh, then I became a junior faculty member at, at Davis and I developed a collaborative, I was interested in plankton ecology and I uh, in my, uh, junior faculty role, I uh, established a collaboration with a, a young new faculty colleague who was basically a physical oceanographer and an atmospheric scientist. And we looked at the problems of, in, uh, of aquatic ecology with, uh, in which the uh, uh, things like turbulent diffusion and, and the mo water motions, the physical part of the and chemical part of the uh, environment were uh, of paramount importance. And so I, I got a crash course in the physical environmental sciences as a junior faculty member. Uh, and then in my first course assignment in the, in the brand, brand new, as it was then, Division of Environmental Studies uh, was to teach a course with a sociologist who'd sort of uh, put the course on the books, uh, the title of which was The Principles of uh, Human Ecology. And uh, so this was the first time I'd had any serious exposure to social science kinds of topics. And, and uh, uh, more or less, as Sergey uh, said uh, uh, about Darwin, it was pretty obvious that, that culture and cultural evolution were unusually important in humans. And so one of the things I did in that course uh, in the I think in the first iteration even was to give a really primitive uh, lecture on, on cultural evolution. You could see that that cultural evolution and genetic evolution had a lot in common, but there were also a huge number of, of differences. And I felt that talking about all this with Rob Boyd, who came, became my longtime uh, collaborator, he was a physics undergrad and came to Davis to uh, uh, to look to do environmental policy and his PhD was essentially an economics degree. He studied the energy uh, system, you know, the global energy system and took courses in, in, uh, in uh, economics. Uh, he, his degree reads uh, ecology, but uh, that was a bit of a, we had a pretty loose uh, curriculum so you could do what you wanted. Uh, and so uh, 
the biology by 1950 was a natural science. Nobody uh, quarreled with that idea. I don't know if anybody had ever, but uh, I couldn't find out much about the history of, of uh, the uh, curriculum and that sort of organization of, uh, of biology in the first half of the 20th century. But by the time I came, uh, you had to study physics and chemistry. They were acknowledged to be important. And uh, uh, the taxon-based uh, subdisciplines were still strong. So at Davis in 1950, we had a, a botany department, a zoology department, and a bacteriology department. And uh, cross-cutting themes but were of uh, growing importance. Uh, uh, so uh, Watson and Crick had uh, uh, published their uh, the section of the DNA molecule in 1953. And, and of course, this was against a backdrop of a whole lot of other uh, uh, important uh, pieces of work in genetics, physiology, cell molecular biology. Uh, ecology had been a strong discipline for a while, and so had evolution. So these things that cross cut the traditional taxon based uh, 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 disciplines were uh, growing in importance. Uh, and so the uh, subdisciplinary structure and curriculum began to evolve uh, rapidly. And uh, there was what I take to be a, a, a theoretical argument about the um, uh, against the importance of disciplines. Disciplines conceived in the model of uh, of zoology, botany, and and microbiology. So uh, I'm inclined to grant that uh, the practical importance of departments, uh, academic departments, scientific societies, and specialized journals, grant programs, all that sort of thing, all has to be organized in in uh, small scale and medium scale uh, units. And so uh, uh, somehow we have to chop uh, biology up into a bunch of uh, of pieces. It, the same with the uh, social sciences. Uh, but nature really is, is more or less seamless. These, uh, uh, anything we establish by way of descriptions or, or organizational principles for uh, biology or the social sciences are highly artificial. We can, we can do it most any way we want, and we tend nowadays to do it in multiple ways. Uh, I was impressed with uh, Donald T. Campbell's uh, uh, fish scale model of omniscience, he called it. Uh, uh, we want our uh, specialties to cover nature completely, and, and, but also to overlap. And uh, so any way we organize it, uh, it's going to have that uh, character. For example, uh, biochemists view cells as bags of interesting chemistry, and the physiologists view they are uh, specialized uh, uh, parts uh, making uh, tissues work. Uh, uh, <coughs> and cell biologists are sort of between the two. And so that's one sort of local model. But uh, uh, it's a kind of an n-dimensional fish, this fish that we have to cover with scales. And, uh, and the uh, disciplines that interact are uh, not necessarily uh, sort of obvious neighbors, like uh, the example for cell biology. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, ecologists depend enormously on the physical and chemical sciences. That's uh, certainly my I experience. And uh, uh, you might to on any given problem, you might have to mix in some geology, some physical oceanography, some geochemistry, meteorology, and so on. Yeah. Uh, if you're studying a community of biological organisms. Uh, uh, but you might also have to uh, dip into physiology or molecular genetics or evolution to understand your, uh, your system. Uh, so uh, there are multiple connections across uh, uh, between these uh, fish scales, if you want to think of it that way. And so ecology, I think of as an interdiscipline, not a discipline. It's uh, uh, it's uh, opened all these other influences. And in fact, it's sort of constituted by all of these other influences. You can't just uh, draw a neat line around ecology and say that's ecology and it doesn't have to, you don't have to worry about say physical and chemical uh, environment uh, 
considerations. You can't do that. It's inherently a physical and chemical discipline or interdiscipline, as I would call it. So uh, uh, there are any number of uh, uh, interdisciplinary uh, fist scales is, uh, uh, scattered across the uh, 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 biological sciences. And, and these, as I say, were becoming uh, more and more important. So many interdiscipline uh, fields uh, had societies established uh, in the natural sciences between the 1920s and the 1950s. Uh, Sergey pointed this out. Uh, not so much in the social sciences, uh, but increasingly. Davis also had a, uh, it still has, uh, uh, a lot of applied biology departments. So the College of Agriculture uh, uh, is, a, is a good example uh, uh, here. It's, uh, uh, we are the, the Cal College for the state of California, the main Cal College at any, any rate. And after the Second World War, the, uh, to upgrade the, uh, uh, to be more ambitious, the uh, powers that be in the College of Agriculture decided that their strategy would be to hire basic scientists, the best basic scientists they could get their hands on, or the best scientists in general they could get their hands on. And then they would offer them a, a summer salary and, a, and pay for a technician if they would establish a partly applied uh, career. And uh, <clears throat> a lot of people did this, and it led to uh, interdiscipline departments. Uh, so uh, uh, a typical department might have an ecologist, a biochemist, a physiologist um, in every department. And uh, so this in turn led to the formation of graduate groups in which the uh, uh, faculty pull themselves out of their uh, uh, interdisciplinary department and uh, uh, went back to training graduate students in things like genetics and ecology. Uh, uh, independently of their of their departments, and so this was a quite successful organizational um, innovation. I have here that uh, just to give you a feeling for what these sciences or departments are like. This is uh, uh, cribbed from the Department of Plant Sciences uh, website. These are applied uh, botanists, if you want, but all of the ancillary disciplines like soils and plant nutrition and that sort of thing play. A role, and you can see here in red. I put there. They, they announce, and it's a. This is the headline announcement of their web page. Is that they're based on the core disciplines of genetics, physiology, and ecology, and then their their mission statement, and but uh, uh, which is the usual kind of uh, mission statement uh, stuff. And then down here at the bottom, you can just scan your eyes across all of these. Uh, uh, fields that they cover within that uh, department, uh, a ton of different kinds of, uh, of things that all sort of uh, um, interdigitate. And this it seems to me is a kind of a, a model for this uh, interdiscipline kind of organization. The uh, biological sciences uh, transformation of the departments in that period was uh, uh, somewhat similar. They, they inherited these taxon-based departments that I mentioned. Uh, they added genetics and then biochemistry and, and biophysics and animal physiology, more modern kinds of departments in the, in the uh, 50s and 60s. And, and uh, uh, the uh, younger faculties in the, as I mentioned before, in, the, in these traditional departments struggle with the old guard. And eventually, the, uh, a division of biology was established. Formerly, the half of the uh, basic uh, uh, biology departments had been in the College of Agriculture, and half had been in Letters and Science. And the division of biology brought them together out, out of those departments. Eventually, there was a College of, of bot Biology was established in 2005 that, that uh, dissolved the uh, uh, vestiges of the connection to the to letters in science and agriculture. Uh, and it has now five departments. You can see the names of them there. The, uh, the old taxon-based departments have largely uh, uh, disappeared, except there's pl still plant biology and, and microbiology as departments. So they, 
the vestiges of those remain. But the inter what I call interdiscipline structure uh, has come to dominate. And uh, some of the key organizational innovations I think are important are, are funding sources, uh, NA, NSF and NIH in the medical sciences uh, have been really important uh, uh, in biology, but uh, the traditional funding in the, for anthropology and, and similar social sciences in NSF is, is uh, uh, pretty weak. The Templeton Foundation has been a, a bright spot in this regard, uh, but it's faced uh, uh, funding cutbacks in the last couple of years. So. Uh, it's a bit of a problem. The funding sources for this interdisciplinary interdiscipline move in in uh, in the United States are are limited. Europe's do, doing uh, uh, much better. The UK's ESRC's uh, uh, fund uh, funded a lot of nice work. The EU's the ERC's similarly, and the German Max Planck Society has created at least two directorships uh, in. in uh, closely related to the theme of, of cultural evolution. And I don't know if people know about the Max Planck Society or how many people do, but it's a, uh, the, uh, uh, the directors of uh, departments uh, uh, get on the order of a million dollars a year just to uh, basically over their signature. Uh, and uh, there are also fair numbers of active researchers in cultural evolution in Brazil, New Zealand, Australia. Japan and other places, uh, uh, but Europe and the United States tend to uh, tend to dominate. Uh, uh, in biology, there there were key undergraduate curricular innovations that I think were really important. So the uh, the teaching of biology and natural sciences, I said before, is already in place when I became an uh, uh, undergraduate uh, uh, student. Uh, uh, but by now, it's the what we didn't have was a was a uh, a unified freshman course that all uh, all biologists and in, in specialties would take. But around 1980, the uh, uh, new uh, uh, division of biology uh, established a uh, what I call a real fish scale course, a, a four uh, course introduction to biology that. Well, you can see the titles here of the of the different uh, the four courses, and <clears throat> so the concept of biology is as interdiscipline is underlined by the way the uh, first year uh, first second year curriculum is organized. Uh, it turns out to be very hard to decide what to do with such a course. How to how to it's uh, biology is a vast, complex, and growing. Uh, field and it's uh, really hard, even taking four quarters, to see how you can shoehorn all of biology into uh, into to what would it be uh, 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 180, 120 lectures. Uh, it's uh, uh, and the I was at peripherally involved with a reorganization of the of the thing in the, in the 1990s, and uh, it was. The people, the faculty who who were undertaking to restructure the course were uh, really believed in it, and at the same time, it was really hard to uh, to accomplish. And yeah, but they were bound and determined to do it. And I I thought it was a it was a great exercise because the faculty had to think about all of biology as a whole, and I think that was as, as good for the faculty as it was for the students who took the course. Uh, so, it, uh, what we need to promote, I think, in the uh, human sciences is uh, is uh, evolution as as a toolkit. Uh, I've already talked a bit, uh, about that, I think, in a, in enough uh, uh, length. Uh, we we need to be a little careful. With I've come to discover that many social scientists think that uh, that evolutionists are an imperial are imperialists. They're, they're obnoxious uh, bullies trying to horn their way into history and a bunch of other uh, social science-like topics. And uh, some people uh, talk of evolution as the synthetic principle of biology uh, and the social sciences too. It's not, I mean, it's a synthetic principle. It's not the synthetic principle. I practiced ecology for years and 
never uh, applied to evolution once. Uh, uh, it has a, ecology has its own synthetic uh, principles that are just as important as as evolution. But it, evolution is really important. It's just not the only thing. Uh, so it seems to me we need to teach an introductory humanology one course that is similar to the to the biology course that uh, an interdiscipline course that uh, uh, and again I think this is be as good for the faculty as it would as it will be for the students to. Uh, getting sociologists and anthropologists and psychologists and in a committee of them in the same room to hammer out what everybody sh uh, at the first year level needs to know about humans is not going to be easy. And but it, we need to drag those guys out of those disciplinary silos. It seems to me. And uh, we need to. Uh, uh, so we need to promote uh, more and stronger interdiscipline departments and. And get them more money and and so on and uh, uh, and we need to uh, promote uh, a certain uh, it seems to me to be amused uh, tolerant uh, contempt for the concept of disciplines that's a sum total of my uh, that's a good way of summarizing my argument for interdiscipline uh, for uh, interdisciplines. All right, comments and discussion. Okay, give me a second. So thank you very much, Pete. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, uh, we, we have several questions here in Q and A's. Um, the first one, um, the first one uh, is about the distinction between culture and social learning. Uh, yeah. It seems to me, and that's uh, what is asked, that social learning is necessary for culture, but not sufficient. Well, uh, uh, I guess, uh, to my way of thinking, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, culture depends on social learning. Uh, often the term is applied uh, to animals and the term culture to not well, non-human animals and culture is applied to uh, uh, to humans but the, and I think that uh, it's true that that uh, human uh, cultural systems are as far as we know considerably more complex than any we know from other other animals, although uh, it, it doesn't do to uh, think that animals are entirely simplistic in their in their cultures. So <coughs> I use social learning and culture essentially uh, as synonyms, really, with the caveat that there is this uh, 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 a big gradient in the uh, in the degree of complexity of culture, and with a considerable gap between humans and and even the most fanciest culture in other species. All right, thanks. Yeah, there is a couple of more questions on uh, uh, culture and learning. Uh, for example, this one here. This is what I'm trying to get at. In my view, there is a sharp distinction between animal culture grounded in social learning and human culture that requires the cognitive capacity to recognize oneself as identity with a group member. Well, uh, I know there are a lot of uh, discussions along those lines, and uh, uh, I was just reading a paper that uh, argued that uh, uh, on the basis of uh, neurological evidence that uh, carrion crows are conscious. Uh, uh, and uh, so I, I'm, uh, I'm, I sort of tread lightly in that area. I'm, uh, it's, there's a long history of, of trying to draw a qualitative distinction between uh, humans and other animals, and 
one by one, most of these uh, have fallen. We used to say that the humans were the only animals that had culture. Well, it turns out that at least lots of other species have so, uh, uh, social learning, at least. And, <clears throat> and uh, back in my youth, the uh, idea that humans were the only animals that made tools was just, just falling by the wayside as, as uh, for example, Jane Goodall's uh, uh, discovery that uh, chimpanzees made uh, termite fishing tools. Uh, uh, and of course, it turns out that lots of animals have uh, use uh, uh, tools, uh, the uh, cactus spine deploying uh, Galapagos finch, for example. So uh, I'm of the, I mean, we don't know, uh, but I'm uh, going to guess that uh, that this uh, that the continuity between humans, the cognitive continuity between humans and other animals is going to be come clearer and clearer uh, if, the, as indicated by this paper about uh, uh, carrion crows being conscious. Thanks. Um, there's a couple more questions on uh, culture and learning, but, but I think you've answered uh, them already. But there is another couple of questions on uh, cumulative culture and on conditions for cumulative culture and on the differences between humans and animals as far as uh, cumulative cultures and so on. Could you comment on that? Yeah, so uh, uh, Rob and I and, and others have argued that, that uh, uh, that cumulative culture is a, uh, 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 a hallmark of, of human culture. And by cumulative culture, we mean something like, uh, uh, well, take a, a fairly simple tool like, uh, like a, uh, a stone tip spear. Uh, you've got to uh, know how to shape the uh, shaft of the, of the spear. You have to be able to nap the stone that you uh, uh, are going to mount on the end of it. Uh, then you need something adhesives or and or cordage to uh, to uh, to stick the uh, uh, stone point firmly on the end of the spear. So, and each of those things is is fairly complicated. Uh, knowing which wood to pick and how to how to shape a, a spear. If you're going to throw it, it has to have uh, has to fly straight, and that turns out to be a aerodynamic problem that's not not simple. So there's a bunch of discoveries that had to go into uh, even something as simple as a stone tip spear. And uh, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, whether uh, non-human animals show any any cumulative culture at all. And, and Rob and I have been caught arguing that uh, uh, that humans are the only species that shows that kind of thing. But then Recent years, Andy Whiten's written papers about this and that uh, uh, convinced me that at the very least that claim is debatable and probably wrong. So they, we uh, we don't know of any other animal. I don't think that makes anything quite as complicated as a as a stone tip spear. But uh, a quantitative analysis of all of the things that uh, uh, humans do and non-humans do is is still not uh, very well advanced. So. Uh, I'm open to, to anything. The, the, the fancier stuff animals do, the more fun the comparative game's going to be. So uh, I've got no, uh, 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 I've got, if anything, I have a, a predilection for hoping that uh, humans don't turn out to be the only animal with cumulative culture. <coughs> Thanks, Pete. Um, there's a couple of questions uh, uh, related to your idea of this humanology one course. Yeah. So one question is, uh, this is a great idea, but how to overcome the lack of math background and in many cases aversion to quantitative reasoning among, among many humanities uh, social science students. And related to that, uh, how, how to uh, overcome the handicap of uh, social science and humanities students that results from a lack of funding and prestige when compared to STEM disciplines? Yeah, well, uh, 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 I think the uh, humanities and the social sciences have to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. And uh, our 
modules uh, uh, that we've uh, commissioned here with the Templeton support are designed to uh, to uh, provide uh, educational materials that uh, uh, people with no math background at all can uh, can uh, use to uh, uh, educate themselves a little bit. Uh, if I had to fault my uh, education as a biologist, uh, I mean, I dutifully took calculus when I was a first year student, uh, yet nobody, uh, uh, none of my other courses exercised that knowledge until I was a graduate student. All of a sudden I discovered I needed to know about that stuff. Uh, and by that time my calculus was uh, uh, completely rusty. So uh, uh, even biology uh, was slow to, uh, to make mathematics a, a, a real part of the, uh, of the curriculum, not just a sort of a decoration. And uh, uh, I think the social sciences have, will have to do the same thing. I mean, some social sciences like economics are, are quite sophisticated in that regard, but I don't think they try to teach math to their undergrads. At least I've been told they don't. Uh, they wait till, uh, uh, sort of like my education, they wait till they've got graduate students and then they drum it into them then. Uh, so I, I think that uh, this is something that maybe even still today could be improved in in biology, and uh, uh, so I think that the uh, uh, the message of our modules is that you know if you're interested in narrative, you also need to know some mathematics because if you're going to understand how narrative works and how it how it evolves, then uh, it really helps to have some mathematical tools to work with. And uh, so I think it's. Uh, I mean, their math phobia is a, is a real thing, but it's something not to be tolerated, I think. We, we just need to get over that. Thanks. Yeah, there is a uh, question about the difference between cultural evolution and social evolution. See if you could comment on that. Well, so uh, I. Uh, uh, societies evolve, and I think of the uh, the main thing that underpins uh, human societies are uh, institutions. So they're the culturally transmitted rules of the uh, of the social games that we play. And uh, so it seems to me that uh, social evolution is a is a specific uh, a subset of cultural evolution. Now the interesting thing about uh, uh, about institutions is that they have to be in some sense a product of uh, of collective decision making. I mean, I, if I'm a stone tool user and I come across a, a steel tool, I can just decide myself to to adopt the uh, the uh, stone tool, and and uh, uh, for the most part, nobody will say boo. Okay, you want to use one of those newfangled things? Well, that's probably worthless, but it's up to you. And but on the other hand, adopting uh, uh, something like, say, uh, compulsory primary education is a completely different thing. If if you can't uh, uh, pass laws and then convince people that the laws are legitimate and and make the institution of primary education a going thing, uh, it isn't going to go anywhere. I now uh, rich people could, of course, uh, uh, decide to send their kids to school or hire a t tutor. But the mass of people couldn't afford to do that. It had to be a tax, uh, had to uh, tap the taxpayers to support. So in, in that sense, social evolution in humans at least and, and the evolution of say technology are, are quite different because of the collective nature of, of institutions. So, uh, uh, well, I hope that makes sense. Thanks. Um, there is an interesting question. Um, okay, actually, a couple of related questions. What are some of the pitfalls in translating the field of cultural evolution to policymakers and general public? How can we diffuse publicly the idea that we can select for better cultural practices? Yeah, that's a that's a deep question, and I've thought some about it. Uh, so part of the thing. Uh, Part of the issue is that uh, uh, to accomplish cultural evolution, uh, 
is an exercise in in persuasion when we when we're talking about uh, policy related issues. <clears throat> uh, and so uh, the uh, uh, there's a moral element to this. So uh, one of my students, Charles Efferson, uh, uh, has worked with uh, uh, genital cutting in the Sudan. And uh, so there are many agencies who uh, uh, are involved in, the, in that uh, effort to end uh, uh, genital cutting. And are there other people who uh, uh, argue that, uh, well, that's what these people do. It's, it's uh, I mean, it's not what we would do, but uh, why do we, why do we want them to stop doing something that uh, just because we think it's icky? That's uh, that's just cultural imperialism. So uh, I think we have to think carefully about uh, uh, about persuasion. Uh, persuasion is often used for malevolent purposes, right? Uh, uh, demagogues and and swindlers are trying to. Uh, uh, persuade you to do things that are not in, in your interest, uh, uh, but are in theirs. And we have a massive amount of that in modern societies, advertising driven uh, 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 persuasion that results in this extremely wasteful, hyper uh, consumerist societies that, that we live, live in, or some of us don't live in, but aspire to live in. Uh, uh, so I, I think it's a, uh, it, it's not a trivial question. I think it's an, but I think it's an important question. Uh, Thanks. Um, you, you talk about that at the end, um, but here are kind of two more specific questions. Uh, and it's about building in interdisciplinary programs. Uh, mm -hmm. If you had any ideas that have proven particularly useful on how to solve this idea or operationalize it to get university administration administrators on board. And the second part of this, do you have any thoughts on how to bring and incorporate the humanities? So kind of dealing with yeah, administrators and how to deal with people in departments already. Right. Uh, so, uh, uh, I think the uh, the main problem is in university administrators, in my experience. Uh, <clears throat> they're often uh, uh, quite uh, uh, in, enthused about interdisciplinary projects. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> the faculty are often the most conservative, in, in again, in my experience. Uh, uh, they they're comfortable being zoologists and and all this newfangled stuff. Well. Uh, uh, requires a lot of money we don't have. Let's just skip it, kind of uh, of stuff. So I think that's a problem in in the uh, in the social sciences, for example, is that uh, uh, anthropologists are comfortably being anthropologists, and uh, when you tell them that they should learn about evolution, they say, "Oh well, uh, that's that's a uh, uh, politically fraught." Uh, whole idea is politically fraught. So we know about the, uh, the culture wars in that, uh, that were uh, started basically by uh, E.O. Wilson's 1975 book, The Last Chapter, and, and got to be hot and furious for a decade or two. Uh, uh, so <clears throat> it's, uh, it's tough to overcome those things. And partly as I tried to uh, hint at in when I talked about uh, the this idea of of evolution as the uh, synthetic principle this kind of uh, the the uh, social scientists and the humanists uh, des uh, describe this as he hegemonic hegemonic and uh, 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 I learned a, a new swear word once years ago I thought I'd never learn a new swear word having and brought up by my father to know all that he knew. Uh, but uh, uh, have you ever been called a totalizer? Any of you? Uh, I was called a totalizer, uh, which uh, uh, basically I was one of those scientists who wants to, to think that they, they're the be all and end all and, uh, and us humanists are just a, uh, a bunch of dim-witted idiots. Uh, and 
of course, they don't like that. They don't like the, the implication that they're dim-witted idiots. And for the most part, they aren't dim-witted idiots either. But, but and scientists can uh, uh, can be overbearing, and uh, we there's a lot of history on, on that. So I, I think one thing is to do whatever you can to lower the temperature of that. Uh, uh, I think of the the sort of uh, hostility between the sciences and the humanities is a is a kind of a intellectual scandal. It's and it's a product of misunderstandings and uh, on on both sides. And uh, scientists shouldn't get overly uh, hegemonic or uh, shouldn't be totalizers. Uh, Thanks for your yeah, there is kind of interesting discussion here. Um, cultural evolution theory attempts to understand the evolution of human societies, but how to overcome the shadow of social Darwinism? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> uh, I, uh, I mean, Darwin wasn't a social Darwinist. He was uh, politically quite... Uh, Quite leftish, right? Uh, which we see most clearly in his, in the uh, Voyage of the Beagle, when he, when he describes his impressions of slavery in in Brazil, uh, <clears throat> after he uh, he became uh, sort of a semi invalid, uh, is uh, he didn't any longer wear his politics on his sleeve. But the the historians of Darwin that that I've talked to all understand that he was. Uh, uh, politically to the left. So, uh, and social Darwinism had a, has a huge bunch of problems and it's still, uh, <clears throat> scientific racism still floats around, right? There's a small cadre of people like we would run across them in the Human Behavior and Evolution Society. I haven't run across anybody like that in the Cultural Evolution Society. But maybe it's only a matter of time. <coughs> And they're often genetic determinists of one kind or another. Uh, so uh, I don't know. Uh, 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 I think they'll. It's it's an inviting idea, and it'll pop up again and again. It'd be, it, it's trying to get rid of it completely. It'd be a whack-a-mole uh, exercise. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, there's no reason to to tolerate it. At least I don't tolerate it. Yeah. yeah, we kind of uh, have questions coming, but we probably should start uh, finishing up. Um, here's an interesting question, and it's about applied uh, sciences. How do we deal with cultural maladaptations? As far yeah, as... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think uh, in some ways you have to... Uh, take them head on. Uh, so I think of one of the uh, most spectacular current uh, cultural maladaptations, I've already mentioned it, is, uh, is hyper-consumerism. It's, uh, uh, it's responsible for a huge fraction of, the, uh, of human impact on the environment. And, uh, and we got to cut that stuff out, right? It's dangerous and scary. And uh, uh, so most of the rich people can take care of themselves, right? You don't have to worry about their uh, about them being uh, victimized by persuasion that uh, tries to get them to behave a little better. Uh, so uh, that that's an easy one. I mean, things like uh, uh, genital cutting are harder, it seems to me, because uh, uh, there is this uh, ethical arguments on on both sides, and 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 how you approach those things it takes quite a bit more sensitivity. Uh, uh, to the to the people involved and, and to the issues involved. Okay. Um, there are some questions about culture in animals and about human exceptionalism. But I think our next, uh, well, not next, uh, the lecture by Andy Whiten will answer that. It will be in, in two weeks. And then there are some questions about the modules themselves and how you can see them. Uh, so basically, you need to go to 
DISOC or Nimbus web page, and, uh, and when there will be a link uh, to tutorials. And uh, as Pete said, uh, five sets of tutorials are already available, so you can go there and watch them and, and study them, and then you'll, you'll see uh, presenters uh, the next uh, five weeks. So uh, we still have unanswered questions, but uh, I think we probably should stop now. Uh, we've been on for one hour and 15 minutes already. So uh, thank you very much to everybody. Uh, great thanks to Pete. Uh, it's been very insightful. And um, we hope to see you again uh, next week. Thank you my very thanks. much. My thanks to all of you.